Hey everyone, I have a very special three questions with Dean Tolson. Here we go, man. My guy. So I got this email and I, I thought it was a trick. <laughs> I thought it was a trick. If you have listened to my podcast forever, you know, as much as I love education, I'm a, a basketball is my thing, right? And so Dean Tolson, who actually uh, is an Arkansas Razorback, who is the, is this right, Dean? You're the leading scorer at, for all time, Arkansas. Is that true? I'm the second leading scorer and the first leading rebounder. I love this. I love it. So Dean Tolson not only played for Arkansas, um, he also played for the Seattle Supersonics, which they actually list as the Oklahoma Thunder, which that kind of bothers me a little bit because you played in Seattle and that's like, bring back the team in Seattle. They and so the team. They stole the team. I know it, it hurts, man. I, I loved, I was like, uh, yeah, like I watched the Sonics and stuff like, yeah. And that's, and you, were you on the team when they won the championship? Cause that's like, right. You were right around then. Hey, I was on the team that we that lost the championship. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. I should have brought it up. If I won. <laughs> oh man. I like I've, I actually, I still can't get over games I lost in high school. So I can't imagine what I just did to you. I apologize. What it feels like to lose a ring. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, I'm yeah. so sorry. It's a horrible way to start. So, um, and so Dean is on actually not just because, uh, well, he, like, he, because he's a basketball player and because he's very accomplished, but he actually has a, a, a book out specific to education and is, it is titled Power Forward, My Journey from a Illiterate NBA Player to a magna cum laude master's degree. And so I'm so excited to have you on. So Dean, um, if you can just tell a little bit who you are um, and, and what you do today and a little bit about your journey, I think that's a really powerful way to start. And, and it, as you can tell, I'm extremely excited and honored to have you on the podcast. Thank, thank you, George, for having me on the show and uh, having uh, all your audience and listeners out there uh, to this uh, very uh, important and vital message we're not only for our, our kids and, and youth, but in, in, in society in general, uh, I, I think uh, education is a failing epidemic. To tell you a little bit about myself, hmm. when it comes to education, I was illiterate growing up as a kid. My mom had an eighth grade education and my dad had a third grade education. So therefore, I went to school all day and, and goofed off and played around and didn't listen and didn't do my assignments and talked to my teachers and, and developed relationships that where I could excel academically. But I did grow to be six foot nine <laughs> right. and become the best basketball player in the entire state of Missouri and made first team all state of Missouri and averaged 30 points a game and 20 rebounds a game my senior year and had over 200 universities and scholarships around the nation. And nobody would touch me because nobody would cheat for me to get in their mm. university. So Arkansas decided to do that. Mm. And so they had a kid take my ACT and SAT entrance examination to get me in. And once they got me in, I went there and goofed off for four years. And all I did was uh, break the records, set the new records, run around campus, drink beer, smoke weed, mm. and hang out with the hippies. Because there was 200 blacks on campus and 20,000 whites. Mm. So not only that I wasn't excelling academically, it was also a culture shock for me to adapt. And so the only way I adapted was they gave me my grades for four years. I didn't have to earn any mm. grades. And I accumulated 80 hours of F on 124 hours of transcript over the next four years. It's like going to college for three straight years and flunking every class. Wow. And so when I got drafted into the NBA, I thought I was going to go second round or third round. 
and I ended up going fifth round, and I was quite disappointed. Hmm. Bill Russell, who drafted me, uh, who has 11 NBA championships, and I was also drafted by the ABA to Dr. J, mm -hmm. and I decided that I wanted to be an NBA player and not an ABA player, and I am the first NBA player to come out of the Kansas City, Missouri area. Wow. In the history of the city. And in the year I came out, the Chiefs won the Super Bowl in 1970. <laughs> <laughs> he just won it again this year. Yeah, yeah, I know. They win it seemingly every year. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was 18 years old at the time. <laughs> and they had a coach, uh, uh, the quarterback Lenny Dawson and Hank Stram and and then Bobby Bell and Buck Buchanan and Otis Taylor and uh, Willie Lanier and uh, Warren McVay. I mean, they 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 had uh, one hell of a squad in 1970. Hmm. And I went on to college illiterate. And when I got to the University of Arkansas campus, I just never knew why I was there right. other than to play basketball. Right. And and I think, and you and I were talking about this, you know, before we got onto the podcast, I, I think, you know, the, there, there's two ways we can go about this in education. We can, you know, be frustrated that we have, you know, students who are not meeting certain standards and then right. to make them meet them, we can lower the standards. And that is, and that might make the adults feel good, but it ain't helping the kids. And so you and I are very on the same page. The expectation is how do we raise kids to these standards? How do we actually raise them to actually achieve, achieve greater levels? Like you're, you're, you're looking at, um, you know, generational poverty happening with families and, and, and something, and that's a huge issue. And then, and then it doesn't actually help them long-term. If you actually lower standards and then they're actually not able to kind of find success in their own pathway. Like my, my work on innovation and innovators mindset is mm -hmm. actually how do you help students find a pathway to success that is meaningful to them, but mm -hmm. it is essential that they have basic skills. They have, you know, like we want kids to achieve incredible things, but you got to know basic skills, you know, like I, I know you're, you're very focused on uh, reading and writing and you're sharing your story about, you know, be, be, you know, moving from illiteracy to, you know, a, a incredible educational accolades. So tell us a little bit about, um, I, I know you shared a little bit about your story in the book, but what's your, what's your hopes, you know, people pick up this book, what's your hopes that it actually does for the education system? Well, you know, George, I've been public speaking to kids for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And the biggest thing that I find is how do you, and how can you figure out how to get their attention mm -hmm. to bring this message to them that we discuss? What, what do you do? So when I was growing up, my mom and my dad always put fear in my heart to get me to listen to them. And if, they, if you didn't, they would whoop you with <laughs> belt or paddle or stick or something. Right. They're gonna get your attention one way or the other. Okay. I'm a I'm a little bit I'm a little bit younger than you. And yeah. I also and I also had parents the same way. I'm yeah, not gonna lie. Yeah, <laughs> I did, I did. So uh, it, uh, it, it uh, didn't uh, skip uh, my generation either. So uh, okay. See they got my attention but they didn't educate. Yeah. See the difference? So now you gotta figure out with these kids that we talk about in this generation hmm. and then technology that has come into to the game, yeah. to, to the fold, is also uh, on top of that, hmm. okay? Like, these kids think that the answer is in a device. And it's not in the device, it's in you applying yourself, committing yourself to sit down there and look at those books and those studies and excel in that classroom and go get help anywhere you need it, uh, that can find it to, to help you overcome the, this adversity of achieving an educational goal. Mm -hmm. You have to do this. And that's what I did. I finally sat down and did it. Me, personally. Yep. Where I goofed it off 
the first 32 years of my life, I started to learn to read and write at 32 years old. That's when I started learning to read and write. And do math and read and, and comprehend and interpret and pass tests. And at 36, I did my first speaking engagement after my graduation to 100 kids in North Little Rock, Arkansas. And it was so impactful and so profound when I did that speech. That was 1988. I said, this is it. This is the answer to these kids. Right. What I did, I, I got to I gotta share it with them so they'll know this is what they must do in their life. It ain't easy, but anything worth having in life is not easy right. to right. obtain. I don't care what it is. And so if you can get this in their minds and instill it in them to for them to want to do it themselves, see, once I decided that I wanted to do it, I went on and did it. I went from a straight F student to a straight A student, magnum cum laude. I love that. Hey, so Dean, what, like, what was like, you, you know, you, you do this later in life, you do this in your thirties. What, what was the spark? Like, what was, why didn't you do it earlier? Like what, what changed in you that all of a sudden you're in your thirties and then you saw value that what, what, what changed in you? It's simple. If a kid doesn't know, where is that going to come from? Hmm. You just want to, well, you think it's going to come to it by osmosis and fall out the sky or something? <laughs> come on, man. Let's be real. I've tried that. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. You're asking, you're asking this kid to do something. Yeah. But then you're not teaching him anything or her. Hmm. Okay. You can't do that. That's a disaster. And that's where the world is today, George. That's where we're at. And we got to figure out a way to fix this. And I've, I've dedicated my whole life to helping fix it. Mm -hmm. And I've taken on the toughest job in American history. I'm the first professional athlete in American history to ever do this, go from and literacy, full blown in literacy to a master's degree and graduate magna cum laude and be inducted into the National Honor Society in Chicago, Illinois, for all colleges and universities across the United States. I'm the wow. first professional athlete to ever achieve that. That's absolutely incredible. You know, Dean, you and I were talking, and everyone knows how obsessed I am with basketball. And like, I played, raft, coached, and, you know, I, I'm like curious what you think about this. So when I coached, mm -hmm. You know, we had really talented basketball players, and my whole thing was, hey, our goal is to win the championship. That is the goal. That's number one. Yeah. But, but we're not likely going to do it. <laughs> so the reality of it is only one team in, you know, in our province, you know, equivalent of state, is going to win. So if that is the only thing we focus on and we don't do it, we'll be failures. My expectation is through this process, hmm. you have great character, you you're you excel in other areas of your life because of what we do here and mm -hmm. and hopefully through that we end up winning the championship like that is part of it too but if we don't win the championship yeah. and you don't develop those things then i failed as a coach and so like th there was times you know like uh i will tell you um sitting players that were really really good was hard because we wanted to win but i it was like, okay, but like, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing in school. They've been, you know, having issues in school. They've been having, you know, some character stuff. And, um, I like, I remember actually one of my players, uh, that I actually wouldn't allow play thanking me later as an adult for doing that. And I'll tell you as a super, you and I were talking, we're both very competitive. It was hard to do. Cause I'm like, Oh, this is I like, like a, I love competition. Right. But it's like, Okay, so for my gratification now, I don't want to hurt this kid in the future. And so right. that was kind of my focus. And I'm curious, like what you, you know, like, you know, it, it is a little unfortunate that maybe you didn't have that same uh, adult mentorship. And, you know, and I, like, I would love to say I was perfect in, you know, all aspects of coaching, but I, I'd be lying too. Um, but like, is that, is that what something you expect from th those who like coach? 
Like it's not just about winning, you know, if, if it's just about winning the championship, like that is the goal. I get it. But like what happens when you don't actually help develop people? Well, we all fall, fall short. Yeah. Okay. This is understood. So once you fall short, what's the motivation and drive and inspiration to keep you going? And you know what I found in that? And it's a human instinct. That human instinct is failure. Who do you want know that wants to fail? Raise your hand and get it up high if you want to fail in life. Right, right. I don't I don't see nobody wanting that. So now that you understand that, what are you gonna do about it? That's what I did. After playing at every level, high school, division one college, the NBA international basketball, semi-pro basketball in the CBA, Continental Basketball Association, playing all over the world. And now at 32 years old, after all that, you're failing. Really? What I'm going to do? I'm going to prove to the world that I'm not a failure and I'm going back to college and I'm going to overcome this illiteracy and I'm going to show the world, whole world that anybody can do this. Mm -hmm. If they put their mind to it and apply themselves to get it done, don't look for and make excuses. Oh, college costs too much money and, and all of this and all that to, 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 to not do the work, to justify it within yourself not to do the work. I didn't look for any excuses. I've made five vows that I stuck with that caused me to graduate. Never ever skip a class. Sit front and center of every classroom and listen to that instructor and take notes. Mm -hmm. Turn in every single assignment on time and complete and, and type if you had time to type it. And, and now you got no, you got, they didn't have computers when I was in school. You got no excuse now. <laughs> and, and number three, take every test. In every single class, on time with the rest of the class, don't take makeup tests. It's going to be harder to pass the test. You only get three tests per semester in each class. You screw up one of them and you, you, you're making a D or a C at a minimum. You ain't going to make no A and B. And then the fifth and final thing, never, ever leave that university campus until you got that degree high in the air and you're holding it and you're showing it to the world. <laughs> I did it. I love it. I did it. And that was the difference between 18 and, and, and 21 years old and the difference between 32 and 36. Sports Illustrated came to the campus of the University of Arkansas for seven days and covered the whole graduation story. And it's in Sports Illustrated uh, in 1988, May of 1988, with Wayne Gretzky on the cover. Okay, do you know what is the weirdest thing? I actually, this is what I saw your name. I read that. In, yeah, sure, I actually read that when I was a kid. Get out of here. Yeah, I did. I read it. I'm That's from it. a small town in Canada. I was obsessed with Sports Illustrated, and I remember reading that story. When and now it totally makes sense. There you go. That's yeah, and then you mentioned Wayne Gretzky. I'm Canadian, right? So obviously, I know who that is. Right? So. Yeah, I love this, Dean. And so this is this is like, you know, there, you know, being in education for, you know, as many years, one of the things I find really inspiring, like, uh, I've written several books. And if you said to me when I graduated high school, like, will you become an author? I said, you'll be lucky if I read a book after this, because I hated reading as a kid. But I started writing in my 30s. And then I found that so you're you're like living proof that um, you can have success in areas, but you, there's no, there's no limit to your learning. There's no, there's no time limit. If there's any time you can change your life, uh, when you're 15 you or when you're 65, right? Anytime you choose. If Absolutely. you remember the, the article, the article was never too old to learn. I love it. That was the name of the article. I love it. That's so cool. Hey, I got something for kids. If they will listen. That's all they got to do. See, I never listened. My head was hard as a granite countertop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, no. nobody can tell me nothing. No. I thought I was so hot. 
um, averaging 30 points a game and 20 rebounds a game on, 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 on the highest levels in life, what are you going to tell me? can't tell me nothing. Mm -hmm. You ain't doing better than me. So what am I listening to you for about some stupid education? Hmm. But the reality of it is when it was all over, it's what showed me that I had never listened. And for the first time in my life at, 30, at 32 years old, I go back to college and I start listening and understanding and learning and comprehending to overcome illiteracy. You got nothing to do with basketball. Right. You're doing it. And the teachers would ask me, how did you get here in the university? How did you even get here? Well, I'm a basketball player. That's how I got here. <laughs> How do you think? I, yeah. I hold the records. Yeah. And, and you know, you got a, a, a classic bunch of guys, Sidney Moncrief, Joe Johnson, mm -hmm. uh, Todd Day, uh, Corliss Williamson, uh, Joe Klein, um, Sonny Weems. I mean, you, you, you got, you know, Alvin Robinson, Daryl Walker, Derek Hood. I mean, I can go on and on. Mm -hmm. A uh, uh, Bobby Bobby Portis to play for the Milwaukee Bucks yep. right now. Yep. You don't hold the records. I do. <laughs> they don't hold the records. I hold them. There's the competitive side. I love it. And so I want these kids to listen to me. It's okay to have this dream that you want in your life. The dream. Okay, that's fine. But where is the substance? Mm hmm. There's no substance to your dream. I, I had no substance to that dream. I wanted to play against Bill Walton and Robert Parrish and all these guys, and I did all that. But then what happened after that? I had zero. And they said, Dean who? Hmm. Dean Tulsa? You, you heard of that name? Who is he? I don't know. You didn't know that to this to, to this moment right here that I'm still the leading rebounder in history school and second leading scorer. No, you know? I, I knew it as soon as I mentioned something. You told me right away. <laughs> Until today. Yeah, yeah. See, because I, I, I never got the credit for doing it. I was punished with my career for not getting an education. And that's why I didn't get to play in the NBA as well. I want all the kids to know that out there is that I was benched by Bill Russell mm -hmm. because he had an undergraduate and a master's degree. And like I just told you, my head was harder than a granite countertop and he didn't play me because of it. Hmm. It is an absolutely incredible story. And I think, you know, everyone listening to this, I think, you know, I know tons of teachers, administrators listen to this too. And I think one of the biggest things that I take away from this conversation is it's going to be easy to say like, yeah, we need to raise the standards and expectations for our students. Like, you know, they, they achieve, but honestly, if you want to no. do that, you got to do it for yourself first. You got to raise it wherever you're at. And it doesn't matter like what you've already achieved. It is actually raising expectations because that's who we gravitate towards those people that we aspire to be. So I, that's what I'm taking away from this conversation right now. Let me, can I, can I speak on that? Uh, Absolutely. In my master's program, I had never taken a math class in my entire life. Mm -hmm. Geometry, trigonometry, algebra, finite, uh, chemistry, never had any math throughout my entire academic career. Now, you got to realize I'm 57 years old now. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'm trying to get a master's. So I take 11 classes to get a master's and the first 10 classes, this is how I made magna cum laude. I made 10 A's in the first 10 classes and I waited to the last class to take master's levels statistics to graduate. And by me never having a math class in my life, 
I've literally got tears in my eyes that I may never, ever graduate and get that master's degree. And the teacher set me down uh, before we started the class. And she says, Dean, this is going to be the hardest thing in life you ever did. And boy, did she never lie. <laughs> yeah. Studied 15, 16 hours a day for five months and had a tutor for seven, eight hours every day out of those 15 hours a day. And I took that class by itself with no other classes attached to it, just that one class that semester, okay? Because that was my graduation. And when you, you I'm addressing this to your prior statement, what you're talking about, about lowering these standards. Yeah. Don't do it. Don't do it. So that teacher that teaches me right now still teaches master level statistics. My tutor still yep. teaches master level statistics at Arkansas right now. And the kids come to him and tell him that the work is too hard and they can't figure out how to do it. Yeah. And he said, I'm going to tell you the Dean Tolson story. Sit down. Hmm. All of you. And when I tell you the Dean Tosa story, I don't want to hear another student come up here and make an excuse to me that the work is too hard and you can't do it. Yep. He was illiterate and did it. You have no excuse. Hmm. Now you get busy, get out there, open that book, get to work and understand and focus your energy on what you're trying to learn. And passed the class. I made a 97 on the first test. I made a 95 on the second test. And on the third test, on the final, the teacher tricked me. And I made a 65 and got a B out of the class, or I would have graduated summa cum laude instead uh, of that. I think, you pretty, I think you still did pretty well. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, that's my, but that's my summa cum laude. My magma cum laude is my summa cum laude. I love it. I mean, see, see, because I, I was never supposed to even pass the class. The yeah. first two weeks that I was in the class, it was 30 students sitting behind me. And I looked back after two weeks and 15 of them dropped the class. Too hard. And these are kids that didn't have math in life. And I'm telling you, this mind over matter is a serious thing, George, in life. You place your mind over the matter that you're confronted with and achieve it. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't start talking to yourself mm -hmm. and convincing yourself that you can't do it and it's too hard and all that because our tears would be rolling down my eyes and my book is just wet, man. Because my head is hurting. My eyes is hurting. I, I, I'm full of frustration. I'm angry because the NBA mistreated me and I didn't make the money that I thought I was going to make being a professional athlete. And, and the dream that I had was just crushed. And that's why I had to do this. Hmm. And at any time in my life, I could just start crying about it all. At any time what was done to me. Now, I take 50% of the blame. The system is the system. And so you're in the system, so you have to take 50% of the blame. So I took my 50% and I went back to the system. I did my 50% and came out with 100%. Now I don't have nobody to blame. And that's what I want kids to understand out there. Don't blame nobody. For your shortcomings and mistakes and faults, you take control of your life, you do the work, you apply yourself, you be committed to yourself, and if, if, even if you do make a C, you'll do better next time. You keep going. And you and, and, and the, the point is, is you, you're going to graduate. You don't have to be a straight A student to graduate. Just wanted to prove to the world that you could, you can't be a straight A student. 
Uh, you know, Dean, and I'm so honored that you 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 came on the podcast today and and you, share your book. And the I'm I'm a big believer, and you you summed it up beautifully. Um, even when people do stuff wrong to you, it's your responsibility to get your get out of it because they, there's they they have no responsibility to help you. Only you do, and so that's something that I'm really passionate about. So, Dean, thank you so much, okay. everyone. I would encourage you to pick up. Uh, Dean's book, Power Forward, My Journey from Illiterate NBA Player to a Magna Cum Laude Master's Degree. Uh, it is in the description down below. Dean, what a pleasure. I, I hope to, I, I hope we connect one time. Uh, if I ever see you, I might challenge you a game of basketball so I can say I, I you know, played against the league. I don't expect to do anything <laughs> against you because you said you're 6'9". I'm 6'4". I thought I was pretty tall, but... But hey, if I could just say I played against you once, that'd be good enough for me. Yeah, I know, I know, I wouldn't be able to score, but if I just say I stepped on the court, that'd be everything. So, hey, hey, Steve Nash is one of my favorite. <laughs> uh, uh, Canadian reference. That's yes, all. My guy, Dean. Thanks for being on, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day. Okay, thank you, George.